are all over each other, but they never fuse. Two drops of slime mold protoplasm frequently go together. But when and why they do, and when and why they don't, is a problem. Sometimes they go for each other in a big way, as you see here. And sometimes there is merely a caress. They touch each other and retreat. But after all, a caress may lead to complete union. And then the protoplasm fuses with absolute compatibility. It's important that the direction of flow in the two cases should be synchronized. One or the other must give way until we have a wholly harmonious flowing together. Frequently, two plasmodia will gaze at each other literally for hours on end, as those two did, and then finally cross at one point. Once they decide that they like each other, then the fusion is complete. Notice between these two, you have a strip of no man's land where fusion never occurs. It took quite a lot of thinking to understand why that should be true. But I believe there's a toxic substance secreted that fills in that space and they simply won't cross each other's toxic area. We come now to one of the greatest problems in biology. What makes protoplasm flow? To say it is life is no answer. The biologist wants to know the physics and chemistry of protoplasmic streaming. I had an idea. Perhaps the outer layer of protoplasm pulsates and pumps the inner substance just as does the human heart. Here is my proof. What you see is the same protoplasm but now speed it up by time-lapse photography. The rhythmic period of the pulsation is, as one would expect, the same as that of the rhythmic flow. Here's a primitive heart, one drop of protoplasm pulsating out, in, out, in. If a theory is a really good one, it should fit all cases. I therefore studied chaos, a giant amoeba with many nuclei and hunted for rhythmic pulsations. I speeded up the photography, but still no evidence of a rhythm. Rhythmic movement, but not rhythmic pulsation. At least we couldn't find it. The theory is an excellent one, but it isn't true. Mind you, the rhythm is there. Rhythmical motion is a fundamental property of living matter but it is not the cause of the protoplasmic streaming. Both are the result of a rhythmic force which we have not yet discovered. Laurent came to me and he said to me, let's measure the horsepower of this living machine. I'll do it by applying pressure or suction, just as one breaks an engine. He built a double-chambered box and put on each side of the central wall droplets of protoplasm connected by a fine living thread. When the flow of protoplasm was in one direction, Camille applied pressure and held it quiet. When the flow was in the opposite direction, suction was applied to stop it. The pressure applied is a measure of the vital force. Here he's holding the protoplasm quiet. And then he records the force necessary to do this. And here he lets it go. And here we have the normal reversal, showing that there's been no injury caused by the experiment. Now he holds it quiet again, and each time records the pressure or the suction necessary to hold it quiet. From these measurements, Camille drew curves which depict the rhythmic flow of protoplasm. These curves, such as this one, Dr. Camille analyzed as a physicist would a curve in harmonics. 
I felt that biology had at last become an exact science. Note in this curve the little irregularities at the top to the right. Note that they always recur. This led to a remarkable discovery that there is not one rhythm in protoplasm, but many rhythms. Protoplasm is a polyrhythmic system. Later in Japan, Dr. Kamiya measured the electrical force or potential of flowing protoplasm and found the same rhythm there as he had found when he measured pressure. In short, mechanical pressure and electrical pressure parallel each other. The meaning of this is far-reaching, but just what it is we have not yet found out, though I have an idea and I shall tell you about it in a moment. About this time, when biologists and chemists were thinking in terms of polymer chemistry, of macromolecules and long molecular fibers, my friends in Europe said, the power driving this living machine is within the stream, not at the surface. It is the flowing molecules themselves, the long, accordion-pleated polypeptide chains, which move the stream, or rather, they are the stream. These folded molecules open and close and move forward like a caterpillar. If you can imagine seeing at a distance an army of caterpillars coming down the Champs-Élysées, the procession would appear to flow. This is another beautiful theory, but I don't believe it. You can't open and close these molecules so easily. I want to show you now the nervous activity which muscle fibers display, first shown to me by my colleague, Dr. Cookson. Notice the rhythmic procession of waves, which represent impulses radiating from nervous centers. These I like to call excitation foci. Remember, too, that in a plasmodium, there is not one rhythm, but many rhythms, such as you see here. I concluded that all forms of motion in protoplasm are the result of nervous impulses emanating from excitation foci. These rhythmic waves in muscle fibers are basically the same as those you saw in the protoplasm of a primitive slime mold. Synchronized with these visible waves are electrical impulses, which can be measured and recorded. Electrical impulses, therefore, are responsible for protoplasmic movement, for the contraction of muscle, and the transmission of messages along nerve fibers. This is my theory, and this is as near as we have gotten to a physical interpretation of life forces. I've always been interested in the twists and spirals in living things. And so I thought, protoplasm must have a twist in it. And I went in search of it, even though some of my friends said, pooh, another one of Seifert's mystical rhythms. You know, Darcy Thompson, who was a great student of form and growth, studied spirals in animate nature with great care. I, like every biologist, have long wanted to meet Darcy Thompson, but the opportunity did not come until late in life, and of all places, on the dance floor at the City Hall in Aberdeen, Scotland. Darcy Thompson, a fine old man, then 80 years of age, was there dancing with a lovely young lady whom I should judge to be about 18 years of age. But the hour was late, past my bedtime, and I <coughs> took the matter in hand and went on to the dance floor and simply interrupted. Darcy Thompson glared at me and said, you can't have her. And I'm afraid I was rude, but I said, I don't want her. Then he said, what do you want? And I said, I just want to meet Darcy Thompson. Well, he said, all right, who are you? Oh, I said, that doesn't matter. You never heard of me. He said, who are you? I said, I'm Seifert. Oh, yes, he said, you're the fellow that thinks everything grows in spirals. And I said, well, you're an authority on growth, doesn't it? He said, of course it does, but you thought you discovered something. 
And now, this is how we prove that protoplasm goes in spirals. We attached a tiny mirror to the end of a thread of living protoplasm and reflected a beam of light onto a circular scale. Dr. Kamir did the experimental work with his usual brilliant ingenuity. One day he called me into his darkened room and all that I saw there was this spot of light traveling back and forth on the circular scale. But I knew what it meant. Protoplasm has a twist in it. As the protoplasm flows up and down the living thread, the mirror on the end of the thread slowly turns and reflects the spot of light. And so we show that all life has a twist in it. I think you'll agree that protoplasm is a very remarkable substance. Often I talk about it as if it had intelligence and my colleagues raise their eyebrows. I don't say it is intelligent, but it does often do the intelligent thing. And after all, we are made of protoplasm.